Sometimes you want to have a bit more control over your machines rather than just letting them run all the time. The circuit network can help you a lot here, stopping you wasting resources, controlling different parts of your factory and generally making things work better. Welcome to Lawrence Plays where I'm going to introduce you to the circuit network and then run through some of the simpler uses for it. The circuit network at its most basic consists of red cables and green cables. These cables carry signals around the factory. The signals can be a quantity of resource or item or they can be numbers that you define yourself. Each cable can carry a different number for every item or signal available, so you could put signals representing 28 coal, 5 oil refineries and an S on a cable without them interfering with each other. Various devices in the world can be connected to these cables and then set to either output information to the cable, perhaps the contents of a chest or a belt, or to read information from the cable and then act on it, perhaps turning an inserter off when it's not needed. You also have three special devices called combinators, which interact in even more interesting ways. A constant combinator will output whatever signals you tell it to constantly, hence the name. An arithmetic combinator can perform maths on the signals being fed in, and a decider combinator will look at the input and provide a specified output if a condition is satisfied. Cables themselves are quite short, but you can run them further by stringing them between pylons. Attaching cables to pylons is also very useful because if you mouse over a cabled pylon you will see the signals on that cable in the right panel. Note that these are colour coded for the two different cable types. If two red cables touch their signals will be combined by adding, but if a red and a green cable are on the same pylon they stay completely separate. Cables are fairly cheap to make but note that if you place a blueprint that includes cables they will be added completely free by the bots. If you're playing the space exploration mod, you can also place free cables from the navigation satellite view. So, that's how they work, but what can you do with them? Well, the very simplest use of a cable is to stop an assembly machine when enough items have been made. Here I'm making assembly machines, but I don't want to completely fill this chest up. I'd like to stop after 15. So, to do that, I connect a cable from the chest that's storing them to the inserter that's filling the chest, then click on the inserter to open its configuration dialog. Here you'll see that there's now some extra options that don't appear without the cable. By default the inserter will be disabled until you configure it. So here I can say that I only want it to be enabled if the number of assembly machines is less than 15. Now the inserter will run until the chest has the required 15 assembly machines and then stop, note the red light on the inserter, preventing any more from being added. If you want to be slightly cleverer, you could run the cable to the input inserters and then cut off the supply there, which would mean you wouldn't end up with ingredients and completed assembly machines buffered inside the machine that's making them, but that's a lot less clear as to what you've done, so I don't think it's worth the minor savings. Resources are cheap in Factorio after all. Another possibility, once you have bots running, is to use the logistics option on the inserter. If the inserter is loading into a red or yellow chest, you can tell it to run until there's a specific number of the item available on the logistics network, which includes items stored elsewhere in other chests. This is definitely a better option, but it does require a logistics network to be set up. Oil balancing is another basic use. So advanced oil refining produces heavy oil, light oil and petroleum gas, however you'll probably need them in slightly different proportions than the recipe provides. Fortunately, you can crack heavy to light and light to petroleum, and circuits can make sure that this only runs when you need it to, while still ensuring that you don't run out of any of them. Put the refined oil products into separate tanks like this, then fit pumps leading off the heavy and light oil tanks to your cracking facility. Now link the tanks to the pumps with cables. These will read the contents of the tanks, allowing the pumps to act on those values. The simplest and to be honest, probably the best way to set this up is to set the first pump to run if there's more than 15,000 heavy oil in the tank and the second one to run if there's more than 15,000 light oil. This will stop them overflowing, provided you've got enough cracking plants and enough load on the uh, petroleum gas, but it will also ensure that you always have some heavy oil available for making lube, eventually stabilising at 15,000 of each of the oils. If you want to make this even cleverer, you can wire it up to only run if the output tank is below a certain level, but in my experience this isn't required. A similar method can be used in a centrifuge running the Covarex enrichment process. I like to set up my centrifuges to input U238 from a belt and then to output everything into a chest, then reload the centrifuge from that chest as well. 
I can then have them unload the chest onto an output belt with a filter inserter when there's more than 100 U235 in the chest, ensuring that I always have enough to continue the Coverex process, but also keep a steady stream being sent away. You may also want to turn off the new U238 inserter if there's more than 10 U238 in the chest, because sometimes it can get a little unbalanced. You will probably also want to turn off something off when the U235 backs all the way up to the centrifuges, otherwise it won't stop running until the chests are completely full, and that's a lot of uranium. Nuclear power plants will use up fuel at a steady rate, whether the power is being used or not. This can be very wasteful, especially if you have a lot of solar available as well. To solve this problem, I like to fit a large number of tanks between my heat exchangers and my turbines. In my experience, 96 tanks seems to be sufficient for a 2x2 power plant. These buffer the steam so that the tanks fill up when the system is capable of providing more power than needed. If I link all these tanks together with cables, and then attach the cable to the inserter that fuels the nuclear reactor, I can stop feeding in fuel when the tanks are partially full. The reactors will continue to work through the rest of the fuel that's already been put in them, and then eventually shut down. Note that you can copy settings between inserters by shift right clicking to copy and shift left clicking to paste. It takes quite a while for it to run through the fuel left inside it, so if your factory is using up most of the available power, you'll find that the reactors still run most of the time, but if they're only providing a bit of top-up power, perhaps, uh, perhaps only needed at night or when a big smelting array fires up, then this could save you quite a lot of uranium in the long run. With this system, you can also add additional tanks and turbines, allowing the power station to provide more power than the reactors can produce for a short period of time. This can come in very useful with certain mods. Next up, I've got a railway station that's being fed from an iron mine. I've called it iron ore pickup because that's what it's for, but I don't want my train for the smeltery to come out here to collect the ore unless there's already a full train load available. So I link up all the chests in the station with cables and then connect them to a decider combinator. When we open up the decider combinator, we see that we can choose a condition and then what happens when that condition is satisfied. So I'll say, if there's more than 2000 iron ore, then output one, green tick. I choose the green tick because it's a positive feeling signal unlike say a red cross and it doesn't have a specific meaning uh, like a single iron ore would. I can then wire the output side of the decider combinator to the station. Then we open up the station and set it to set the train limit to be equal to the number of green ticks on the cable. This means that when the station content goes over 2000, the train limit will be set to 1 so that a single train that's trying to go to iron ore pickup will be allowed to turn up and take the cargo. If you feed multiple signals onto the same cable, they will be added together automatically. This means I could put in a second decider combinator that watches for more than 4000 iron ore, so two train loads, and that also outputs a single green tick. This would mean that if you had enough iron ore, you get two green ticks, one from each combinator, and the train limit would be set to two. This works nicely because even though the iron supply does drop enough that the train limit returns to one while the first train fills up, the second train has already decided to go to the station, so it will complete the trip anyway. The final thing I'm going to look at in this video is using hysteresis on a circuit network signal. This is where you want something to start working when a signal is one value, but to stop working at a different value. This is typically used to turn a coal power station on when an accumulator drops below, say, 20% due to a lack of solar power, but to keep it on, keep it running until the accumulator is back up at 80%. This means that the power station won't be flickering on and off several times a second, but it will still kick in when it's needed. To set this up, place four decider combinators in a square like this. The top left one is your on condition, so whatever you want to turn your machine or switch on. In this case, I'll say if power, on the A signal, is less than 20%, then output a green square. This is my on signal. The bottom one says that if power is greater than 80%, then output a red square. This is my off signal. The next top right combinator should be set to check for green squares on the input, and if there's any at all, so greater than zero, then to output one green square. 
Finally, the bottom right one is set to monitor for no red squares and if there are none, to pass through the signal. Link the first two directly into the second pair like this, then hook up the right pair in a cross like this. You can now use the output from either of the right combinators to control your switch, turning the power to the accumulator on when there's a green square sent to it. Finally, link up the accumulator to send the stored power level to the input of both combinators on the left. When the power goes low, the set input, green square, triggers and sends a green square to the cross. The top combinator sees more than zero green squares, so it passes the signal through to the other combinator. The other combinator can't see any red squares, so it passes everything through and the green square gets passed up to the top combinator. This means the top combinator now sees an input of two green squares, that's still greater than zero, so it still outputs one green square, and the whole thing is in a stable position. When the power rises above 20%, the input combinator stops outputting the green square, but the top combinator in the cross still has the green square signal from the bottom combinator, so it keeps outputting the green square, keeping the switch turned on. When the power rises all the way up to 80%, the red square input triggers, sending a red square to the lower combinator. This means that the combinator now sees more than zero red squares, so it stops outputting anything, meaning that there's no green square going to the top combinator, so the whole system turns off. It's now back in its initial state, so once power drops again, it will flip back over and turn on. I think this covers pretty much everything I've used combinators for in normal play. Sure, I've done some more complicated things with playing with mods. You can see my spaceship automation video if you're curious about that. And I do know that other people have made much more complicated systems, including entire computers. However, these things tend to be things that people do because they can, rather than because they're useful for a normal game of Factorio. I hope this has given you a useful insight into how circuit networks operate, and why they're so useful. But if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments, or come along to one of my Factorio streams to ask me directly. Thanks for watching, I hope you'll come back for the next video.